Welcome to the latest Duke Media Briefing on the COVID-19 pandemic. I'm Gregory Phillips with Duke Communications. A US Food and Drug Administration Advisory Committee voted yesterday to recommend Pfizer's COVID-19 vaccine be approved for use in 5 to 11 year olds. With us today to discuss the safety and effectiveness of this vaccine for that age group is a physician who led a trial of COVID vaccines in children under 12 this year. Dr. Emmanuel Chip Walter Jr. is Chief Medical Officer of the Duke Human Vaccine Institute, where he directs the Vaccine and Trials Unit. He is also a Professor of Pediatrics at the Duke School of Medicine. Dr. Walter, good morning. Good morning, Greg. So to start us off, can you just give us a quick overview of the trial you conducted, who the subjects were, and what the results were? Sure. So um, we have been working in the past year and starting, I guess, about March of, of this year on the Pfizer pediatric COVID vaccine trial. Um, that trial did, as I said, start in March of this year. And it's really been conducted in, in a few different phases. The trial includes children from between the ages of six months up through 11 years of age. And um, basically the trial uh, first uh, includes those group, uh, that, that age group of children, but really in three different kind of cohorts uh, within that age group. So it's children between the ages of five to 11 and then children uh, between the ages of two and four and then children between the ages of six months to two. Uh, we really started out the trial in the first phase by trying to determine what the best dose of vaccine, and this is the again, the Pfizer-BioNTech uh, vaccine is. Uh, so we really started by evaluating three different dose uh, or doses uh, of the vaccine. So 10, 20, and 30 microgram uh, doses of the vaccine. And uh, in that part of the study, we determined for children that are between the ages of, of five and 11, that the best dose for those particular children was uh, really the 10 microgram dose, which is a third of the adult dose. Um, and that really, that those results were based on kind of some preliminary Im, uh, immune response. So determining that the children developed an adequate level of protection. And also that it was really the, the dose that was best tolerated uh, for children that age. So with the fewest side effects like fever uh, and achiness and chills and things like that. Uh, so from there, uh, we went on uh, to evaluate in larger a larger group of children. And I'm just gonna really concentrate on the, the age group that you mentioned um, that is approved for the FDA. We concentrated the study in children uh, between the ages of five to 11 uh, and uh, vaccinated children. Children were randomized two to one to get either 10 micrograms of the BioNTech vaccine or uh, placebo. Uh, so they were twice as likely to, to get vaccine in that, in that part of the study. And then monitored children uh, for for side effects and uh, safety and looking at their immune response as well. Uh, so parents uh, were given uh, a diary uh, to report symptoms on a, a daily basis for seven days after children received the, each dose of vaccine. The doses of vaccine were uh, given uh, three weeks apart just as, as with adults. Uh, and then we measured, uh, uh, obtained blood sp uh, samples from a, a portion of the, the children uh, looking to see whether they got protection from the vaccine. So uh, that study uh, included about 4,500 children, about 3,000 uh, who received, well, over 3,000 who received vaccine, uh, and then about 1,500 uh, who received placebo. Sure, absolutely. Uh, certainly lots to dig into here. And one, one thing I wanted to ask you about, you mentioned that obviously you were looking to see uh, what those uh, generated an adequate immune response. So how do you measure that? What do you consider to be an adequate immune response to, to show that the vaccine is doing its job? Yeah, in this case, this was, uh, uh, it's a good question, an, uh, what's called an immune bridging study or immunobridging study, where we look um, at levels of antibody in a comparison group. And in this case, uh, the comparison group was older, uh, older children, so adolescents, uh, who were, uh, you know, uh, slightly older um, and young adults up to age 30 um, and looked at their immune response in a subset of those people who were in uh, the original Pfizer trial uh, and compared uh, the responses in these young children to those responses. 
because what we knew is that the responses in the older children um, uh, equated to a level of protection. Uh, so we wanted to determine whether children, uh, younger children, given a lower dose of vaccine, had the same degree of protection as the older children. So it's called what's called an immunobridging study, and that's often done in vaccine studies. Sure, thank you. That uh, that makes sense. Um, we know uh, that obviously a lot of parents, you know, have concerns um, uh, about. Uh, the vaccine approval process. And one of the things I wanted to ask you about is because we're looking at emergency use authorization here, can you talk about whether the safety requirements for that authorization are any different from the full authorization that we've now seen for the adult vaccine and that we would expect down the road? Are there any differences there in the safety standards or, or the rigor of the safety requirements for those vaccines? I mean, I think that there's no difference in the safety standards. I think the only thing that would uh, potentially be different in this case, because we're in a pandemic situation here um, where, you know, we're, we're still experiencing the Delta wave, although it's coming down during the course of this study, we were right in the, in the midst of, of, of a pandemic situation. Um, and uh, in, in that case, uh, you really have a public health emergency. So there is a need to get the data more quickly. So I think what you see here is uh, that enrollments are more rapid, getting the data assembled is more rapid, um, and getting the data reviewed is more rapid. It's done in an ongoing basis with the FDA. Um, so, so yes, there is a sense of rapidity, but it really is meeting all the same safety standards. Uh, what may be slightly different is how long um, the follow-up is, but these children are, you know, before you make an emergency use authorization versus a full approval uh, because we're in a pandemic situation. But ultimately, these children are all being followed for, for the same period of time as you would normally do. Sure, absolutely. Thank you. And as a follow up to that, one of the things we've seen um, amongst the vaccine hesitant in the adult population and probably among parents, too, is this whole wait and see attitude. People want to wait and see. And it's not entirely clear what people are, are, are waiting for. And so I wanted to ask, ask you is that with previous vaccines or um, with this vaccine, um, do we ever see effects down the line? Is there any actual wisdom in waiting to see the effects of a vaccine? Or if we were going to have side effects or any adverse effects, would we expect to see those within the first couple of weeks after somebody gets a dose? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, that, that's a really good question. I think the the um, the answer there, at first, I, I think I would look first at the experience uh, so far with this vaccine and the millions of doses that have been administered uh, to older children uh, and adults and look at the safety track record there, which has actually been quite, quite good. Um, and uh, I don't think we have any reason to believe that the safety track record will be any, any different in children. So uh, I'm, I'm, you know, really, I think can, and people can be reassured that that um, the safety of this vaccine in children will be really comparable to that which is seen in adults and uh, feel comfortable giving their child the vaccine. Absolutely, thank you. Uh, and just to be clear, is there any difference in the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine that children will receive versus what adults received, or is it just simply a difference in the size of the dose? Um, the vaccine is pretty much all the same vaccine. It will be a reduced dose. Um, as I said earlier, it's a, you know, a third of the dose. So this is a 10 microgram dose uh, versus a 30 microgram dose. Uh, when it is packaged, it will look uh, different. Um, I think that's one of the questions that has come up. It's certainly a question I had. What would, what would it look like? Um, the, I think the current vaccine has a purple cap on the, on the vial. This one will have an orange cap on the, on the vial. Uh, it will be labeled that it will be just for children. Uh, so the adult dose should not be used for children. This is specifically uh, for children, but it really is the same vaccine at a reduced dose. Sure. Thank you very much. Uh, we're going to open it up to questions now. Thanks to everyone who submitted questions in advance. Uh, you can also post questions via the Q&A window at any time. I see we've already got some in there. And if you'd like to ask a question in person, uh, raise your hand in Zoom and we will unmute you when your turn comes around. If you're calling in by phone, you can raise your hand by pressing star nine. Thanks also to everyone uh, watching this on YouTube. So I'm going to go through some of the uh, many questions that we've had submitted in advance here. And one of those is that obviously there's a there could be a massive difference in, in size and weight and, and 
physiology of a child who's five versus one who's 11. So would we expect to see kind of a better immune response uh, among the smaller children because proportionally it's a larger dose? Or are there any differences we should expect to see in reaction among the younger children rather than those who are 10 or 11 and larger? Yeah, I mean, I think that's a really good question. And then once that's probably open for a little discussion, you know, I, I think you, you know, when you design studies, you kind of, um, at, at some point you have to make um, things practical in terms of administration um, and widespread use of a vaccine. So in some sense, you have to come up with some, some age cut points. So that's why when I uh, was talking about the trial design earlier, we had you know children in groups of six months to two years, children between the ages of two and four, and then children between the ages of five to 11. I think what we can say is that probably uh, for the most part, children, and, and yes, there are variations in size, but in terms of immune response, children between the ages of five and 11 should respond no matter what their size is with, with a good robust immune response uh, to the vaccine uh, at, at that one dose, even with a big variation in in size um, that, that you may see. So you might, as you said, have some small five-year-olds and some rather large uh, uh, um, 11 or 12-year-olds. So, but I, I think the, the immune response will be adequate for those, for those kids. Uh, in terms of safety, um, you know, we did study a range of kids uh, within that age group, um, you know, from five to 11, and the safety really didn't appear to be different across the age group. Um, we did divide out this, the, the bigger part of the study. So we are looking at um, lower doses or a lower dose actually in, in the youngest children. So, Sure. Thank you. And, and yeah, later on, I'd like to come back to the children under five, since that's obviously still something that's out there. But right now we're obviously focused on the, uh, uh, the FDA approval for children five to 11. And um, you're related to that yesterday. Um, the, uh, the the hearing was very much focused on risk versus benefit. You know, the benefit uh, to uh, to vaccinating this population versus the risks. Um, based on your you know your work um, with a vaccine study and your work as a pediatrician, do you feel that uh, approving the vaccine at this time for children five to eleven is the right call? Yes, I'm absolutely confident that this was the right call. Um, you know, I, I think there there was a large and rightfully so. Um, and a good robust discussion yesterday uh, about risk versus benefit uh, for the vaccine. I think, you know, obviously the, the issue that came up was the, the issue about myocarditis and risks of myocarditis, myocarditis being inflammation of the heart muscle and, and also pericarditis, inflammation ar around the heart. And um, if you look at that, you know, you have to realize that um, you know, myocarditis has been seen following uh, the mRNA COVID vaccines, or what's the Pfizer BioNTech uh, is one of the two mRNA COVID vaccine. The other one being the Moderna uh, vaccine. Uh, that risk really for for developing myocarditis uh, seems to be greater after the second dose of vaccine. Uh, it's more commonly seen in males, particularly young males between the ages of 16 uh, to 30. And uh, the rate in that particular group is about 40 per uh, million doses of uh, second doses of COVID vaccine received. I think it's really important to recognize that not all myocarditis is the same. In fact, you can develop myocarditis after developing COVID uh, as a complication. And that myocarditis from COVID actually is usually quite severe and makes people quite ill and causes a prolonged hospitalization. The myocarditis that we've been seeing after vaccine is generally fairly mild. It does often lead to hospitalizations, uh, but it's usually very easily treated uh, once, uh, you know, once it's recognized. Uh, so, uh, you know, I think you have to weigh that risk of developing COVID. Uh, so depending upon the prevalence of COVID in your community uh, versus, uh, you know, the risk of uh, uh, and complications from COVID, including myocarditis versus the risk of myocarditis uh, from vaccine, which is exceedingly rare. Sure. Thank you. So I Very think cool. in this case, everybody decided and after considerable del del deliberation yesterday, decided that, you know, the, the, 
the risk versus benefit uh, much was tipped in benefit of vaccination. So. Sure. A uh, very quick logistical question, um, because we've had this come in from a few people. Will uh, the vaccines for this age group, if approved, take the same form as adults in that they'll need two shots a few weeks apart, or would it be one shot because they're children? Uh, no, it's, again, uh, it'll be very, very similar to the adult uh, dosing schedule. It'll be two shots of a lower dose. I just want to emphasize that, of third, of the 10 microgram dose for children, and they'll be administered uh, three weeks apart. Sure, thank you. A couple of follow-up questions to uh, the points you just made. Uh, someone asked if there have been any cases of myocarditis in the 5 to 11 age group as a result, presumably, of contracting COVID that you know of. Uh, great question. Uh, you know, it was certainly in the trial. Uh, the, the short answer is no, there were no cases in the trial, but uh, we, it was something we really, uh, uh, because we knew that cases of myocarditis had been reported uh, that we really carefully looked for uh, in in the study. So if you know, if certainly if if a child complained of any pain, uh, chest pain, um, or shortness of breath, that was something you know children were immediately the families were immediately called and children were evaluated. So it was examined for quite closely in the trial, and there were no cases. So. Terrific, thank you. Um, going back again to the hearing yesterday, there was at least one doctor on the FDA panel who expressed concern over making a decision for millions of children based on studies that had only a few thousand children. What reassurances could you offer to parents who might have that same concern? Yeah, I, I think um, that what I would say about that is, you know, again, I think we have to look at this vaccine in total. Uh, with the millions of doses that have been administered to adolescents and and adults, um, that uh, we can be reassured by that. And then the other factor is, if you're looking for, you know, a, a study of 3,000 children getting the vaccine, it actually is a pretty good um, group. If you're looking uh, for fairly common side effects, if you're looking for rare things that occur of rates in, you know, in one in a million, there's absolutely no way that you're going to be able to tell that in a study, even a study that included a fairly large number of, a, a much larger number of children. So um, I don't think that we would accumulate any more data with a, a larger trial. So uh, um, at some point you have to say, you know, we are confident that, you know, uh, what we know about this vaccine, that it's safe and uh, comfortable giving it to children. Sure, thank you. You mentioned earlier also that the, uh, the trial started in March and that the children were followed. Will you continue to follow the subjects from that trial? Um, you know, are you continuing to follow them now? And if so, how long will they continue to be followed to monitor for any long-term um, side effects? Yeah, we'll continue to monitor children for two years, so. Gotcha, excellent, thank you. Really close contact with participants, so. Marvelous. Um, another question we had, there was a recent poll that found that um, almost 25% of parents don't intend to get their children vaccinated. And uh, another third said they would wait and see. Uh, and about a third said they would get their kids a shot right away. Do you think that that level of uptake where we only have a third who, who plan to get it right away and more than waiting and seeing, will that be enough to make a difference uh, in the spread of the virus or to, to protect that population and others? Or does more need to be done to convince hesitant parents? You know, I think, you know, vaccine hesitancy has been with us for, a, a you know, a long time. I think um, certainly it, it's been somewhat prevalent um, with the COVID pandemic. And I think, you know, people, uh, uh, you know, there will be people that will uptake or, will, um, you know, decide to get vaccinated or have their children vaccinated quite quickly. There'll be some in that middle road uh, that that will be kind of waiting a little bit, as you pointed out. And then there will be also some that just don't want to get vaccine. I think, you know, the, the issue is you're correct that without achieving a certain level of protection in the community, um, uh, you may not get the full benefit of the vaccine to achieve what we call herd protection or community protection uh, from a vaccine. In fact, vaccination rates with this particular or coverage with this particular vaccine, these particular vaccines with this virus actually probably has to be on the level of 80, 85 uh, percent to really achieve that kind of herd or community protection uh, from from infection. Uh, so, you know, with the numbers that you are saying, uh, you know, that doesn't quite meet 
that goal. Um, but I think if you look at the population as a whole and consider that children count for roughly about 20, 20 some percent of the population, getting as many children vaccinated as possible will lead to overall population protection. So, Sure, absolutely, thank you. And as a, as a follow up to that, um, because it seems like generally, uh, anecdotally at least, the cases in children have been lower than they have been in adults. So when it comes to vaccinating this population, how much of it is about protecting that population and how much of it is about protecting the, the more elderly people and immunosuppressed people um, in terms of you know, getting children vaccinated because of the elderly relatives they live with, for example? How much is it protecting kids and how much is it protecting others or is it just both? Uh, my, my short answer would be it's both. Um, you know, I think, you know, we have to be able to afford children the same protection from COVID through vaccination that we afford to adults. I mean, I think that is the, the right thing to do. Um, it, we do need to realize that with this current Delta surge, children now count for about 25% of reported cases of COVID. And that's been really a little bit different with Delta than it was earlier in the pandemic. And part of that may be related to the fact that we have a larger portion of the adult population uh, vaccinated right now. Um, and then I think most importantly for kids is, you know, I think we've been kind of lulled by this thought that yes, the pandemic's worse in older adults and, and adults with comorbidities, but children aren't totally spared from COVID. Um, you know, I think when I last looked the other day, there have been 700, nearly 750 deaths from COVID in children under the age of 18, 160 deaths in this age group for which we're now um, considering uh, approval uh, or authorization for the vaccine between the ages of five and 11. Um, and that's way more uh, deaths than it uh, occurred due to uh, influenza in a, in a typical year. So I, I think if you kind of put it in that perspective in terms of health, uh, we really do need um, to get uh, children vaccinated. Other reasons, uh, you know, to prevent complications from COVID uh, in children. I think, um, you know, children can have this condition where they get inflammation in their uh, multiple organs in their bodies or their heart, their lungs, kidneys, uh, their GI tract um, intestines um, called uh, multi-system inflammatory syndrome of childhood um, it makes can make kids quite ill. Um, there have been about 5,000 or more reported cases of that with 46 deaths occurring uh, due to, due to that um, complication of COVID. Plus there are long-term uh, potential long-term effects of COVID which we really haven't even well defined um, in this population. And I guess the last point for why vaccinate children now is really to allow kids the freedom to be kids uh, and do all the things comfortably that kids do, go to school, um, you know, do sports activities, other after school recreational activities and, and just do the normal things that kids wanna do, so. Sure, absolutely. And, and related to that, we had a number of questions about mask mandates. There are some school districts that are starting to lift them. Do you think that's premature? Do you think that the uh, once the vaccine is out there, that that is something that could be uh, considered? Yeah, that, that um, issue has come up lately. I think, you know, right now, I think it's premature to do that until we get some, you know, we know we, two things happen, have to happen. One, we have to get a good level of coverage of uh, for vaccination in, in um, this age group of children. So that, that has to occur. And um, the rate of COVID in the community has to fall to a certain level, I think, for us to feel comfortable about really lifting mask mandates. So I think it's a little premature. We're not, we're not there yet. So maybe we can have those discussions in a few months from now, but I'm, I'm not sure we're, we're there yet. So. Sure, thank you. Uh, I'm getting through as many of the questions that we've got as we can. We have a raised hand um, in the chat, so we'll go ahead and unmute you. Uh, you can go ahead and ask your question. Hi, this is Judith with CBS 17. This might also be something that's a little bit premature, but we're talking about boosters for older populations. Do you anticipate that later down the line, this may be something that we start to consider for these younger uh, age groups? Yeah, thanks for that question. Um, it, it's a good question. I don't think I have 
quite the answer for you at this time. I think it depends on, uh, as, as I said, you know, where where we head with the pandemic. I think what we do know um, in adults is that the level of antibody um, uh, over time, um, you know, over the period of six to you know, seven months or so, uh, declines. Uh, so. Um, that um, you know your your level of protection from vaccination kind of decreases over or through vaccination decreases over time, um, and so I think uh, there are a few things again that would have to happen. One, we would have to study uh, you know boosters in children um, and 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 do that first uh, before we decided that that was something uh, we wanted to do. Uh, and two, I think you would have to have a compelling need. So, you know, there would still have to be a, a COVID in the community um, uh, in order to, to do that. Uh, so I, I think a few questions have to be to be answered before we decide on, on boosting. Splendid, thank you. Uh, we've had some questions about um, the nature of giving vaccines to five to 11 year olds. Would you anticipate that people would go to their regular family pediatrician to get this rather than having the kind of vaccine centers that we've set up? Do you think that the rollout should or will be different for children of this age group than it was for older kids and adults? Yeah, that's another good question. And I think um, we will see the rollout being somewhat different and there may be two tracks. Um, you know, I think when you look Children generally get vaccinated in the physician's office, whether it be a pediatrician or family practitioner's office um, for most of their routine. Talks. That's kind of their medical home. That's where they feel comfortable. Um, and that's truly, truthfully where the vaccinators feel comfortable having those discussions with families about vaccination and, and um, administering vaccines. Um, so, um, the form, new form or the formulation of the vaccine for children that will come out actually won't have as many constraints upon it as we did early in the um, rollout of the vaccine for adults. So the vaccine, um, in this case, it'll be refrigerator stable for up to 10 weeks. Um, so that will enable vaccine to be more easily administered in the practitioner's office. Um, than, than was in the initial rollout. So I think you'll probably see um, some larger centers still administering vaccine to kids where they feel comfortable to do so uh, and they have the resources and set up to do so. And also you'll see vaccine, more vaccine be administered in, in pediatric offices, which is a good thing. Sure, thank you. Uh, we've had another question about uh, multi-inflammatory syndrome, syndrome in children, which I know was a concern in some of the uh, some of the cases that kids have had. Um, and apparently, this question asks that there are some concerns about undercounted cases of multi-inflammatory syndrome in children. Do you share those concerns? Do you think that could have impacted the FDA's benefit versus risk analysis? Uh, I don't. Um, if you're talking about multi-inflammatory condition following COVID, um, which you know we know it occurs, I don't know that. Um, I, I mean, I think that was considered in all the, the risk benefit analysis. Was it, uh, has it been undercounted? Um, perhaps uh, there are cases that aren't recognizes, recognized and, and reported. So um, that, that is certainly a possibility, which I think would actually, if, if there are cases of MISC that were undercounted, it really just tips the, the risk benefit into the benefit ratio so, of vaccination. Sure. Um, through the course of your trial, did you uh, have any breakthrough cases? And if so, how many did you see? Um, you know, if you look overall in the trial in, in this age group, yes, there were some breakthrough cases of, of COVID uh, that did, did occur. Um, there were 16 in the placebo group um, that occurred overall and three uh, that occurred in the vaccination group. Um, which you know calculated out um, because it was a two to one randomization uh, gave us a, not, an estimate for 90% uh, efficacy of the vaccine. Now, what is remarkable, I think when we set out to do this study that we, we set out early on, this was before the Delta wave. So um, we were just coming down through the summer months where rates of COVID were fairly low. So I think we really necess didn't necessarily anticipate um, that we would see, um, be able to tell whether the vaccine was going to be effective in this 
in this age group. Uh, you know, unfortunately, we hit the Delta wave uh, with a lot of cases, um, which um, again enabled us to determine um, um, what, that the vaccine was effective against preventing preventing infection, and this was really largely infection due to Delta. So, um, so you know. It, even though uh, it wasn't a good thing that we've had the Delta wave, uh, we were able to, uh, to assess efficacy uh, of the vaccine. Sure. And as a follow up, we know that in adults, you know, the emphasis has been that the vaccine won't necessarily stop you from getting COVID, but it will stop you from developing complications that require hospitalization. Is it the same thing in children that we won't necessarily expect that it will just prevent everybody from getting it, but it should just prevent those more serious cases? I think I don't think we would expect that things would be a lot different in children than adults. I think you know early on, um, I think it will prevent um, some infection and, and transmission. I, I think as levels of antibody decline over a period of months, that you may see um, that rates of you know being able to become infected. Um, that, that yes, you will be able to become infected, but I think. Uh, we can be reassured that you know serious illness uh, will be prevented. In fact, I don't think anybody in the pediatric study, any any of the cases, uh, none of them were serious. So, sure, thank you. Um, obviously, last year we saw uh, a, a big bump in COVID cases around the holidays. There wasn't a vaccine then; there is now. But how important do you think the timing is to try and get as many children as vaccinated as possible before the holidays? given that there will be probably more socialization, more people intermingling. Uh, could it make a big difference if we can get a lot of children vaccinated before the holidays this year in terms of overall cases? Yeah, I think that that's another really good question. I, you know, I, I think what we do know that um, from some recent studies that came out of uh, schools here in North Carolina is that in fact, children are more likely to acquire infection outside of the school setting than in the school setting. So they're, you know, contracting infection uh, either in the family setting or recreational settings and, and, and not in the school setting. So I think what you, as you suggest, is people travel more over winter holidays, um, go and meet extended family or friends um, that, you know, their chance for acquiring infection um, will potentially increase. So that really does underscore the need to try to, to um, you know, increase vaccination coverage uh, prior to holidays if we can. So, so with the rollout uh, occurring, um, you know, it is going to happen overnight, but I think of trying to get as many people, many children vaccinated, it, it, you know, it may not all happen before Thanksgiving holiday, but, but uh, trying to get um, as many kids vaccinated before winter holidays is, is important. Sure, thank you. Now, of course, in addition to being a vaccine trial administrator, you are a pediatrician. Uh, people are asking about uh, any advice you could give for parents on how to prepare their children for getting the shot and whether you whether the children had difficulty with it in the trial. Um, yeah, yeah, that's a, a great question. I mean, I think most of the kids that we um, um, had in the trial, they were actually at, at this age, um, you know, um, they're, they're all verbal. Uh, they were all excited to be part of the trial. And, um, you know, most, uh, you know, obviously children don't, most people don't like needles. So, but, but uh, you know, I think they were all willing and excited to be part and get vaccinated. Um, and, um, you know, I think what we can tell parents, um, and I, I don't necessarily, um, you, you know, I th you can, depending upon the level of understanding of your child, parents can have that discussion with their child that they may get a fever, they may feel a little achy, not feel as good, um, that, you know, the day evening of or the next day following vaccination. Um, and, and that's to be, to be expected. They may, you know, as I said, get a little low grade fever. Those things can be managed um, pretty easily by giving, you know, if you get symptoms like that, fever or achiness or headache, um, they can be managed with ibuprofen or, you know, with kind of some resolution of symptoms. And usually the symptoms are pretty mild uh, in most cases, maybe a little bit moderate, but they resolve within a day or two. Sure. Thank you very much. Uh, we are uh, getting through as many questions as we can. We've got some more raised hands. So uh, Kristen, we're going to go to you next. You're unmuted. Please go ahead and ask your question. Hi, can you talk to me a little bit more about how 
um, approving this dosage for kids is, in, is crucial to the overall population protection? Yeah, thanks, Kristen, for the question. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think we have to realize that you know, children do make up about 20% of the, or a little over 20% of the population. So if you really look at needing to achieve herd immunity, you probably need to get about 85% of the total population somewhere around there uh, vaccinated, depending upon how transmissible the virus is. Um, and, and Delta, we know, is really transmissible. Um, so that's why I'm kind of saying 85%. And I always, you know, it's a little tough to quote those numbers, but you really need to achieve a high level of vaccination. Well, if you already uh, exclude 20% of your pop, 20 some percent of your population um, under the age of 18 from getting vaccination, that's a significant proportion of the population. So um, vaccinating children is really an important part of, of um, developing community protection. Um, the other thing we, I mean, we do know that kids this age can, age can spread infection. Um, I think examples from influenza, in fact, school age children are probably the biggest transmitters uh, for flu. So um, it, it would not be unanticipated that, that um, you know, children this age can spread uh, COVID. So it really is important to get them vaccinated for community protection. Thank you very much, Dr. Walter. We'll move on uh, through the people with their hands raised. And so Alice Park, uh, you are now unmuted. Please go ahead and ask your question. I just wanted to ask if you could um, provide a little more detail for parents, let's say of 11-year-olds. Um, you know, we do have 12-year-olds uh, authorized for the full dose of this vaccine, and we now have 11-year-olds authorized at a third of the dose. Can you just tell me a little bit about the antibody levels or immunity you were seeing in this study for 11-year-olds and how you might answer questions from parents who might say, if I have an 11-year-old, am I better off waiting until their 12th birthday and having them get the full dose? Yeah, I, my answer to that is I would not wait. Um, you know, at, at age 11, children will develop as good an antibody response or protection um, protective level of neutralizing antibodies um, in the blood um, from 10 micrograms of vaccine as they do from 30 micrograms. So, so I'm confident that they'll have the same protection. Um, so I would not wait. Fantastic, thank you. Uh, we're gonna move on through the list. Uh, Patrick Thomas, we can go ahead and unmute you and you can ask your question. Okay, it seems like we may have lost Patrick. Um, hey, yeah, I'm here. Oh, there we are. There okay. Hey, Dr. Walter. Uh, we oh. talked a while back about the, the vaccine trials for children. And um, today, um, in, a, in the next couple of hours, I'm going to be entering into a, a pediatric ICU. And one of the things that I hear from practitioners, providers, and physicians um, in a normal ICU is how often patients are begging for the vaccine when it's too late. These are children who can't make those decisions for themselves. So what is sort of your plea for parents of, of children uh, in this age range who essentially um, could soon get the vaccine? Yeah, I mean, I think that my, my advice to parents is this is the best way to protect your child from serious illness and potentially death um, from uh, COVID uh, is to get them vaccinated. It's the best tool we have. Um, and so um, by all means, I would recommend and suggest they get vaccine. Thank you very much. Uh, we have had, we're going to be wrapping up here shortly. We've had a number of questions um, about the trial you performed, because obviously you also had subjects who were under five. And I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about the responses you saw in those children that were younger than five, uh, what kind of dose we might look at, and what you think the kind of time frame might be for whether there will or should be vaccinations available for that age group as well. Yeah, so all I can say is that, um, you know, after the preliminary information um, that we did in the early part of the trial, uh, the dose of vaccine that's being evaluated in children under five uh, 
is the three mic microgram dose, which is, uh, you have to realize that's even a, a much smaller uh, dose of vaccine. Um, so it's a, a tenth of the adult dose of vaccine. Um, so, um, you know, preliminary results look um, and uh, looks like, you know, that was the uh, best dose to give, again, the best immune response or a comparable immune response um, and uh, with the fewest side effects in, in young, youngest, the very youngest children. Um, now, that said, we have not, you know, the, the study is really looking at evaluating that dose in a comparable population size for each of these two, two age groups. So, you know, there'll be another uh, like five or 6,000 children uh, in, the, in the two to four age range and a, a similar size uh, under, under uh, between the ages of six months to two. So it, there will be um, data forthcoming that really, you know, shows whether that dose gives a, a comparable response. So it's, it's, you know, we have to get, wait for the confirmatory data. Uh, likewise, we have to wait, make sure that it's uh, safe um, and tolerable in children that age. Um, so that those data will be forthcoming. I think we probably will see something sooner um, in the children ages two to four than we do six months to uh, two. Um, it's been a gradual um, um, process. Uh, so we will see that data um, in the upcoming months. I suspect that, you know, probably we won't be vaccinating those children uh, till sometime early next year. So, but I, gotcha. I don't have the, the total timeline on that. Gotcha. Thank you very much. Uh, we're going to wrap up here shortly, just trying to cram in another couple of questions. Uh, there were some concerns on the advisory committee yesterday about how a recent infection might impact the risk of my myocarditis post-vaccination. Do you share those concerns or would a higher risk make sense given the pathogenesis of myocarditis? Yeah, I think we really don't know the, the total pathogenesis yet of, of um, what's causing, um, you know, uh, post-vaccination myocarditis after the mRNA vaccines. We really don't know. So, I, you know, I think if I speculated, uh, there are several things you could speculate. You could could speculate that, it, you know, you get a much larger immune response after having had COVID and then getting a vaccination, and that may be uh, an issue. Um, you might speculate that it's dose-related. I don't think we have those answers yet to know that. So, so. Um, you know, I, I don't know that I could can comment a lot farther on that. So, sure, no problem at all. Uh, we're, we're about to wrap up here. We're at time, uh, Dr. Walter. I'd just like to ask you, as a way of reinforcing the point you've already made, if you yourself had a child between five to eleven, uh, would you be going to get them this vaccine once it's available? I, I I'm too old to have children <laughs> five to eleven. But, yeah, I said if you did, <laughs> but but uh, actually, I have grandchildren, and um, I'm hopeful that they will be uh, lining up to get their vaccine shortly. So. Absolutely. Thank you very much. And we are going to leave it there. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Thanks to our panelists, Dr. Chip Walter, for sharing your perspective and expertise. We'll be back on Monday to discuss the Second Amendment case that will go before the Supreme Court next week, a case that could have powerful effect on the carrying of concealed weapons. If you'd like to be notified about that and all our other upcoming briefings, please email dukenews at duke.edu. Or if you're watching on YouTube, please like and subscribe. In the meantime, keep following public health guidelines and please remember that when doing your research, just as when seasoning your food, always choose your sources carefully. 